house of my brother Benjamin. See that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry, bring my father here. And then he fell down upon his brother Benjamin's neck and he wept. And while Benjamin wept upon his neck and he kissed all of his brothers and they all wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked to him. This is the word of love for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So let us pray. May the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of my lips be pleasing in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know whether this has ever happened to you before, but I know as a child it has happened to me. I've been in a grocery store with my family, and I have gotten distracted, and I have been looking at this delicious food, and I think that the person standing next to me is my family, and I reach out my hand, and I hold on, and it is not my mom. Where is my mom? In the meantime, my mom is somewhere in that same grocery store holding on to another child's hand who isn't her daughter. Uh, I don't know. Has that happened to you? It is probably one of the scariest things for parents to get separated from their children. Mustafa is a truck driver. In the aftermath of January 2005's tsunami in Southeast Asia, he had no idea where his five-year-old daughter, Rena, might be. But when he was reunited with her, he held her in his arms, overwhelmed with emotion. He fell to his knees and he cried out his daughter's name over and over. Allah, by the grace of God, I knew you were alive. I knew it. And Mustafa screamed at the reunific reunification, my precious little one, I did not give up. I kept looking. The following account comes from Save the Children website. He said Mustafa was on his way to Midden, miles away from Banda Aceh, when the devastating tsunami hit. And when he returned home, he discovered that his daughter and his wife were missing. Since being separated from her parents, two older sisters and extended family, Rena was registered with Save the Children and was being cared for by a woman named Mutaya in Banda Aceh. The day before Rena was united, united with her father, Save the Children had released 72 names of children whom they had registered as separated or unaccompanied at 20 different camps. Rena's name was on the list posted at the camps and read on the radio and posted on the Save the Children website. And as the father and daughter departed, Rena waved at Mutaya, kissed her and kissed her hand, and Mustafa cradled Rena Augustina kissed her on the cheek, and he then led her out into the sunshine. They were together again. Now we can understand the very human need for reconciliation. We see it. We feel it. Whatever the initial reason is for the separation. And that's why this Genesis story that unfolds in our text is so full of emotion. A violent conflict had separated Joseph and his half-brothers. The story begins with his brothers conspiring to kill him. And then they decide, no, they're going to throw him in a pit, and they're going to sell him in slavery to his cousins, the Ishmaelites, blood brothers. But after this breakup, 
Joseph is taken down to Egypt where he becomes a successful person. He's a manager. He's a manager of the household. He's a manager of the house of Egypt and he becomes an Egyptian officer. But the Bible tells us that the Lord was with Joseph. So he becomes the favorite of the chief jailer. And he later rises to the position of second in command to Pharaoh himself, gaining control over the land as the governor. And it is in this position of power that Joseph encounters his half-brothers again. And their painful breakup results in a reunion. Canaan had been hit by a severe famine. They had not harvested anything in two years. And it was predicted five more years. So the brothers need to go to Egypt to get some grain because there is a harvest in Egypt. They meet with the governor and they don't recognize who it is. They do not recognize their own brother, and they ask for his assistance. So Joseph plays with them a little bit. <laughs> he throws them into prison for a little while, but then he ends up releasing them and giving them the grain that they needed. And then Joseph reveals who he is. I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Their jaws hit the floor. Want yours? <laughs> but he first says to them, now do not be distressed. Because wouldn't you be a little bit distressed? <laughs> and he says, don't be angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God has done something good. God has done something to preserve life. Joseph sees that God can use their ugly, I, I can't think of any uglier breakup, for a wonderful purpose. To put Joseph in a position where he could help his family survive a deadly famine. Now, the brothers might have, from the very beginning, intended something evil and something horrible for their brother when they sold him into slavery. But Joseph was able to act in a different way, all because of the grace of God. So it was not you who sent me here, but God explains Joseph. The, the original breakup may have been painful, but it wasn't all bad. And it's this story that reminds us that when we've experienced awful separation, it is possible to move to reconciliation, as hard as it may seem. Evil is turned into good, and loss is transformed into gain. Events like this can help us gain a fresh understanding after an experience of failure and a sense of purpose after a time of pain. It's a story of estrangement and reconciliation. And it's an account that unfortunately reflects some of the pain we have all experienced from time to time. So are there some hints in this text that can help us overcome estrangement? Well, the first hint is to extend an invitation. Notice that Joseph says to his brothers, Come closer to me. It is so hard to make the first move, isn't it? But we need to remember, at least I need to remember, that the goal of reconciliation is to restore harmony. Harmony does not mean we, might, we will see things the same way. We still hold on to our own separate beliefs. But in reconciliation, we can be together, but separate. And we trust 
In reconciliation, we learn to trust again the offender. If we want to reunite, it may need to begin with an invitation from us to the offender to come closer. This is not an invitation to overlook or to forget or even to dismiss what has happened before. It's simply a mechanism to close the gap a bit, to begin to see each other again as human beings who are sometimes tortured by emotions and forces beyond their control. Personal space is a cultural issue. Most Americans, and I think you can go back to that slide, we're not up to the forgive slide yet. Go back, yep, extending an invitation. Most Americans are uncomfortable when the three-foot bubble is invaded. We know, we call that our personal space. And if anyone comes into that personal space that, you know, we haven't really invited, we say, get out of our face, <laughs> meaning they should kind of leave us alone. But Middle Eastern culture has no such qualms about that three-foot bubble. You visit the marketplaces of the West Bank in Palestine or maybe in Turkey, and you'll see people haggling over price face-to-face, nose-to-nose. Come closer is an invitation to begin a process. Instead of saying, get out of my face, we're saying, get in my face. <laughs> get in my space. We can't begin the journey of reconciliation when we're so far apart with you sitting on this side of the room and you sitting on that side of the room and me on the other. Come closer. Let's talk. Forgive. Joseph says, and now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Let go of the offender's involvement in your life. Let God deal with those who cause the estrangement. When Joseph says that we must forgive 70, 77 times, he's not suggesting that we keep count. He's implying that there must be no limit to our forgiveness. What makes this such a hard saying is that the notion that forgiveness is something that we must do 77 times. If we must forgive 77 times, it's a sure indication that the person who has offended us doesn't get it. The offender is definitely not mending their ways, but that's the whole point. <laughs> Forgiveness is not about keeping score. It's not something we do for the other person. It's something we do for ourselves. Forgiveness is not an action. It's about an attitude. When we understand, or when I understand, that forgiveness is not about some kind of heroic deed, but about a heroic attitude, what Jesus says makes sense. You can count actions but you can't count attitudes. Jesus doesn't keep a forgiveness score. It would have been easy for Joseph to keep his brothers at arm's length instead of inviting them to kind of get in his space and into his face. He could have been, it would have been easy for him not to forgive. But instead, Joseph says, don't be angry with yourselves. The second clue is to look for God's fingerprints in it. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years. 
Now, I don't think that God purposefully punished or purposefully set up something in action, but by looking for a greater purpose that God may be in the middle of this, he can say, God sent me before you to preserve you, a remnant on earth, and to keep alive many survivors. So it was not you that sent me, but God. That's not to say that when distress comes into our life, it is to suggest, this is not to say when distress comes into our life, it is to suggest that in all of our circumstances, if we look, we can find God in the midst of it. Be part of the solution. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. Joseph was not about to forgive and then simply write them off. He enters fully into the circumstances of full reconciliation. And he takes action to help them come closer. He makes the first move. He does the first action. And he does it so that they can find wholeness again. In one of the great Greek comedies, there's an aged, aged farm, farmer who staggers onto the stage. He is weeping. Enemy soldiers have invaded his land. They have terrorized his family. They have killed both of his oxen. His family is pitifully hungry. But when he's asked what he wants, instead of asking for something to eat or something to drink, he says, what I want more than anything else is for a drop of peace to be poured into my eyes. Likewise, Joseph, a drop of peace poured into his eyes. Likewise, us, peace poured into our eyes. If we want to be together again with those who have been so long apart, we'll see in Joseph's behavior a template, a process to help us get started, to make it happen, for peace to be poured into our eyes. May it be so. Amen. As we come to this time of prayer, you'll notice um, we have prayers in our bulletin. And if you follow along and when there are opportunities for you to share your prayer concerns, the ushers um, just stand and the ushers will give you a microphone. So our holy friend, we gather this day as your people seeking hope amidst the hardships of this world. We know that sometimes we're overshadowed by fear, by persecution, by hatred, greed, and sadness. God help us to know that when we are lonely or saddened by this world, your heart also breaks. Remind us that like Joseph and his brothers, you too weep with us. Sometimes, God, we know we are slow to forgive others and that we hold grudges far too long. Help us to let go of bitterness that is in our hearts and help us to be open to the ways you are calling us to show mercy and grace to each other. We know that there are people in our communities and in our world who are suffering from physical pains as well as pains of the heart. Help us to know how to help. Help us to know that our prayers, our care, our presence is often better than letting things be left at arm's length. We pray especially this morning for Nancy Teal's nephew, Matt, who is now in hospice care. 
He's been given two to three months. He's living in South Padre Island. He is suffering from lung and bone cancer. And so we pray to you, our dearest friend, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray also for, for um, Howard Hippert as he recovers from surgery. Are there any other prayers for those in the community? We each have spaces in our own lives which are longing for forgiveness from you. Oh God, help us in the silence of our hearts to now name our deepest longings and our prayers. We gather all of these prayers, both spoken and in silence, and we pray to you, our dearest friend, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for that, for, for that you have heard our deepest longings. We give thanks for healing, for hope, for celebrations. We especially give thanks this morning. And so we pray to you, our dearest friend, as we pray, our Father, If we have no peace, Mother Teresa says, it is because we have forgotten that we belong to each other. In the scripture reading today, Joseph chose to honor a relationship. Through our offerings, our gifts, our ties, may we be in relationship with one another, with Christ, and in Christ's work through this church.
please join with me? Life giver, bless these gifts so they may be used to offer feast among famine, joy amidst pain, courage amidst fear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And please join with me in our closing hymn. As a fire is meant for burning, we're going to sing uh, verses 1 and 2. And it's found in your black hymnal, number 2237. <laughs> please join with me. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And all the people of God say, Amen. Amen.